Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. Uh, I'm your host, Doug Sharp, and uh, I have Rich Gear with us. And, Good evening. Uh, we have our guest uh, with us, uh, Dr. D. Russell Humphreys uh, from uh, from New Mexico, and we are, we are uh, in Old Town, New Mexico, interviewing him today, and we're glad to have you with us on our show. We've been wanting to do an interview with you for a long time, and we're uh, thankful that uh, you have been able to do this and arrange this with, with this time with us. Um, one of the things we want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, is your uh, involvement with the uh, rate group that is uh, in uh, uh, the part of the Institute for Creation Research. Could you tell us a little bit about your involvement with uh, what uh, that uh, group of people are doing? What, yeah, what does rate stand for, start with? Uh, rate is radioisotopes and the age of the earth, and it's the name of a book we just released this January. By the way, we're in Old Town part of Albuquerque, New Mexico, in case some of your listeners might have wondered where on the map was Old Town, New Mexico. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Thank so. you for that. <laughs> uh, well, Old Town Santa Fe too, right? Yes, there's almost all the southwest towns have an old town part of them. But uh, radioisotopes in the age of the earth, and uh, uh, it's uh, a book and a project. We uh, The book was a summary of a five-year research program that seven scientists uh, and others too uh, are involved in. And the scientists are uh, myself, Dr. Larry Bartman, who's the chairman of the group, whom you interviewed a few weeks ago, I understand. Uh, Dr. Gene Chafin, editor of the Creation Research Society Quarterly and also a right. nuclear physicist. And then uh, there's Dr. John Baumgartner, who's at Los Alamos National Laboratory, just uh, about uh, an hour and a half drive north of here. And then, uh, let's see, who else? Uh, we've got Dr. Andrew Snelling, who's a geologist from Australia, mm -hmm. works for ICR. Uh, and then Dr. Steve Austin works for ICR, and uh, Dr. Don DeYoung, who's an astronomer and a physicist. So we have uh, several physicists, several geologists, a geophysicist, and others uh, working on the committee. And we decided uh, the committee is tackling uh, one of the toughest problems in creation science, which is uh, radioactive isotope dating. Uh, we've hit around the edges in creation science before this, but we haven't tackled the problem head on. And so... Uh, you like to do that, don't you? Well... You, you take the tough issues, and we'll talk about something else a little later on your cosmology. You, you take the hard ones that, uh, that seem to be the most difficult uh, things for a straightforward reading of the... Uh, from a creation standpoint. Since you're about to plug his uh, video here, he's got a new video called Starlight oh, yeah. and Time. Starlight and Time. Solving the problem of uh, distant starlight uh, and the speed of light. And uh, this is a, a good uh, introduction to uh, the whole problem and how to uh, how uh, we can actually explain this from a creation point of view. So yeah. uh, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, as well if okay. we can get into it. But yeah, back to rate now. So the the, the, the idea of a radiometric dating, we danced around. What are some of the things that um, that we've done in the past, maybe as creationists, that that you felt were not very well done, or that, that you've got better solutions to? Well, the the main thing that I I and others on the committee uh, felt was that we did not tackle uh, the the problem head on. We uh, a lot of us and most creationists for a long time were tackling the problem by looking at small flaws in the way radiometric dating is done and assuming that, for example, uh, maybe um, if the system weren't closed like the assumption usually is that we could get other isotopes in there to... Def Contamination? To, yeah, so that to mess up the date. Uh, but what I've always felt was that we weren't reckoning with the, the major part of the problem and that is that uh, there's a very large amount of evidence, all kinds of different evidence in the Earth and on the Earth today for a very large amount of radioactive decay having occurred. And uh, yet we have other geoscience evidence that indicates that we, the Earth hasn't been here that long. So if you have a whole lot of nuclear decay occurring, how can you have all of that happening in a short time? Okay, so there are many things, and you've talked about these before. Maybe you might want to 
listen is you don't have to go into all the, all the things that indicate a young age of the Earth as well as perhaps even the universe, but the but the Earth, um, and then and then explain why how you can tackle this head on. So, so what are some of the things that indicate we have a young Earth? Well, uh, I mentioned one at dinner tonight. This is why I don't like outdoors. We'll run up this, will be this will be gone. You'll never see this. Because we'll never see the light of day again. <laughs> okay, one of them is the accumulation of mud on the ocean floor. Uh, it's accumulating much too rapidly. And present slow plate tectonic subduction doesn't carry it out nearly as fast as it should. Another in the ocean is accumulation of sodium in the ocean. Uh, that accumulates too fast for the oceans to be three billion years old. So if the ocean really were billions of years old, it would be as salty as this salt lake, the Great Salt Lake or the Dead Sea, with lots of salt on the bottom, and it would be choked with dozens of kilometers of mud. Well, I remember uh, uh, reading about the uh, salt and sea in uh, uh, Imperial Valley. Mm -hmm forming in just a couple of years, and the salt in that is uh, saltier than the ocean, isn't it? Yes. I remember last year you had an interview at, you know, on a radio station back in our hometown, and a caller came in. I, I was laughing so hard at the end of it, um, because you were talking about the, the most it could be based on the salt content would be such and such, and, and this person would call in and say, what if the salt contents were different? And you said, yes, but I'm starting from a zero content. And you still, I don't know what it was. That, that yes, he was, he was saying, well, suppose it, he was helping me. He didn't <laughs> know it. He <laughs> inadvertently <laughs> helping me. Uh, he was saying, suppose you didn't start off with some salt in it. Suppose you started off with zero. And I said, yes, um, that's what I did to get the number. And uh, so he hadn't followed my argument very well. No. So he, uh, he wasn't really stuck his help to his own cause. <laughs> so it was quite, quite wonderful. But there's several other, number of other different lines of evidence pointing to a very young world. In fact, there are probably hundreds of processes that one can point to. But uh, some of the others are just uh, how long uh, people have been around. If people have been around uh, in more than hundreds, uh, say more than a million people uh, on the earth for very long, as evolutionists like to say, uh, right. for the length of the Stone Age, You'd have billions of bodies in the Earth, and you don't. You'd have, you don't have that many Stone Age bodies in the Earth. So, uh, let's see, what's another one? Uh, age of comets. Comets wear themselves out too quickly in the Earth, so in the solar system. And the theory to explain that uh, doesn't do a very good job. Uh, there's lots of formations that point to very rapid formation, such as polystrate fossils, trees oh, right. that go through several fossil strata at once, or the evidence in the fossil strata themselves that they've been laid down very rapidly. Uh, yeah, we've talked about some of the, how sediment sedimentation, we've actually seen with Mount St. Helens, uh, how things like that can happen very quickly, and long ages are not needed. So so those are, so there are many evidences for a young Earth, mm -hmm. but uh, still there's that bugaboo of the radiometric the, 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 it seems to indicate long ages, and you, right. you, your group has decided to attack this head on. Right. Uh, well, right. we found uh, a lot of evidence that during the Genesis flood, and probably during creation week as well, uh, the rates of radioactive decay were billions of times higher than they now are. And uh, hmm. one of the pieces of evidence for this is right here in New Mexico. Uh, there's a uh, uh, caldera, a volcanic caldera, they call it, uh, called in the Hamas Mountains near Los Alamos. And uh, deep hot rock has been taken out of boreholes there and sent to Oak Ridge and examined, and there are tiny radioactive crystals in this rock. Is that near Bandelier? Yeah, it's near Bandelier, so you might, you might get to see some of that. And uh, these crystals are called zircons, they're microscopic, but they're where most of the radioactivity is in granite-like rock. And uh, when ra radioactive decay of uranium takes place, uh, you produce helium. The alpha particles you've heard about, the alpha radiation, those are helium nuclei. And quickly those helium nuclei become helium atoms. And uh, helium atoms are very slippery little things. <laughs> they can uh, wiggle through the tiniest crystal lattice and escape. And the hotter the lattice, the faster they escape. Now remember, this is from hot rock. 
it's a uh, hundred to three hundred degrees C centigrade, so it's very hot rock. Okay. Uh, so helium should diffuse out of these tiny little crystals very quickly, within thousands of years. And yet, um, the crystals are supposed to be billions of years old on the evolutionary scheme. 1.5 billion years, according to uranium lead dating of those crystals. I see. So have you measured this uh, diffusion rate of helium? Well, we're on the process of doing that, but what put us onto that was Robert Gentry at Oak Ridge found that huge amounts of helium were still in the rock. Up to 58% of the helium that would have been emitted in 1.5 billion years was still there in these tiny zircons. So that almost sounds like a smoking gun. At, uh, right. So, you know, what, what it's saying to us is that over a billion years worth of radioactive decay took place from the helium, the amount of helium that's there, and yet uh, because of the fast rate of diffusion of helium out of these zircons, we can say that it took place less than thousands of years ago, within thousands of years ago. So there's too much helium in the rocks, but not enough in the atmosphere, right? That's the other half of the, of the thing. Up in the Earth's atmosphere, Dr. Larry Vardaman has talked right. about this, um, there's less than one two thousandth the amount of helium that should be there um, if we had had five billion years worth of nuclear decay. So helium would stay in the atmosphere as opposed to being diffused out in the cosmic space or something like that. Right, and a good thing or else other gases would have diffused out with it too because helium mixes with all the other gases. People have this idea that helium would float up to the top of the atmosphere and yeah. be concentrated there. No, it would be mixed just like every other gas, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and nitrogen. So uh, the fact that we haven't lost much of those gases uh, should give, be a clue to people that we haven't lost much helium. Yeah, and so if the radioactive uh, decay rates took place for that long period of time, we should all be talking like this because of the helium, I, right? I was thinking about doing that, but I, I was going to let him be the, be the, be the community, community guy. So, uh, yeah, the uh, Larry Vardaman, it's easy to calculate how what the leakage rate of helium should be. Uh, out of the atmosphere into space, and that's small compared to the amount of helium that should be leaving the surface of the Earth and entering the atmosphere. So now you publish some but of these. I'm sorry, you publish in, in this in this book, right? Some yeah. of these findings in the book. Oh, uh, has there been any reaction among secular scientists or other people that? Not have a lot. There, I think they're still digesting the book. The book is uh, pretty technical. It's 750 or more pages of nearly. 700 pages of very technical stuff uh, in the geosciences and uh, nuclear sciences. So, uh, so no, there hasn't been a lot of reaction, and it's to me it seems like a, a lot of uh, digesting going on. Yeah, there might so be. It's like the it's snake only been in the a few big. months. It's only been a few months. So I imagine uh, after a while there'll be more. So, are you now going? Are you in the process of? of uh, doing, building on top of this research is what you what Yes, we're okay. trying to go forward with this. It's a five-year research program. And one, just to give one example, uh, nobody has ever measured the diffusion rates in several of the minerals that we need to know the diffusion rates of helium in. So we're doing this experimentally, and, uh, and just to get this experimental result, and we have a prediction that's made by the uh, creationist model, and we have a prediction by the evolutionist model. Uh, some of the results are already coming in, and, oh, really? and they're much, much closer to the creationist model than, than they are the evolutionist. Uh, you, you seem to have a history of doing that, don't you? With, with yeah, the, uh, I guess yeah. I've gone out on a limb now about a half dozen times, and so far the limb hasn't been sawn off uh, under me. So. You know, why don't you talk about some of those things? Maybe we can sort of bridge into your <laughs> cosmology. But the theory of magnetic fields is one. Yeah. yeah I, Talk a little bit about that. That that is very fascinating to me because you okay. you first wrote something what back in eighty four, eighty three. Yeah, the uh, back in nineteen eighty three, I uh, published a paper in the Creation Research Society Quarterly. I think it was the December issue of that year. Uh, the creation of the Earth's magnetic field, and uh, my jumping off point was a verse in Second Peter chapter three, where. Uh, uh, it says that the earth was formed out of water and by means of water. And that said to me, well, you know, since the earth is not water now, God must have transformed the water into other stuff, iron, all the stuff that we see around us, silicon. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, it, I thought of a way that he could make the earth's magnetic field while it was still water. If, if he had lined up all the protons 
you know, the two hydrogen atoms right, right. have two nuclei that are protons. And if he had created the water with the two protons all uh, pointing in the same direction and all the water molecules, all its protons all pointing in the same direction, then you would get a magnetic field which was just about the right amount you needed to have an Earth 6,000 years old and the decay taking place. So, so uh, that struck me as kind of interesting. And uh, it would be, a, you know, if you're, going, if you're God and you're going to make a magnetic field, here's a real easy way to do it. Uh, just when you create the water molecules, create the protons all pointing in the same direction. Well, real easy for God to do, but not for us to do. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm just uh, sort, but then the, sort of thinking a, God's thoughts after the decay of the magnetic field as it, yeah. uh, as it was could get out of alignment. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you, you can actually have it as, as a measurable rate. Is that right. The uh, Earth's magnetic field is decaying at a certain rate right now. It's uh, It would take about... Uh, 1400 years to decay down to half its present strength and it's uh, we know from archaeomagnetic data that it has been decaying at that rate for about a thousand years. Oh wow, I didn't know that. Okay, yeah. I didn't yeah. realize that. So, uh, and then historically it's been measured for the last 150, no, actually 170 years. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's followed that nice decay path, uh, decay curve right on down. Uh, but before that, it did complicated things, and we think the complicated things are a result of the reversals of the Earth's magnetic field that happened during the Genesis Flood. There was a lot of roiling and boiling in the Earth's core, and uh, I thought back in the mid-80s that this would produce the magnetic reversals rapidly within a matter of weeks. In other words, one week during the Genesis Flood, the field would have been pointing north, and the next week, the magnetic field would have been pointing south. Because of the, the turmoil or all the... Because of that turmoil that was going on in the core. And uh, so uh, that would be a result of the, of, of the flood, flood events. Uh, it actually has a very nice tie-in with John Baumgartner's catastrophic plate tectonics. It would yeah. The catastrophic plate tectonics would produce uh, this rapid roiling and boiling in the Earth's fluid core. If you get the roiling and boiling, you get the rapid reversals. So what was this out of, on the limb prediction that you made in this paper that... Uh, uh okay, well in, the, in getting back to the origins of the field, yeah. in, I uh, thought, well, in, if the Earth's field had this neat an explanation, and it, you know, it fit the data pretty nicely, well maybe God made the uh, fields of all the other planets and, and parts of our solar mm -hmm. system the same way. So I just said, okay, I'll apply the same theory uh, to the Sun, the Moon, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And uh, what would the fields be there? Now, at that time, space probes had measured some of those fields, but not all of them. So, uh, with, for the ones that space probes had measured, it fit my theory, theory pretty nicely. So I published that in 1984, December of 1984, in the Creation Research Society Quarterly. And uh, for the two planets that had not been measured, Neptune and Uranus and Neptune, uh, I made a prediction. I said, okay, if the theory is any good, then the strength of the field at those two planets should be thus and such. And uh, my, my prediction for the planet Uranus was about uh, 100 times, 100,000 times larger than what evolutionary right. predictions were. And uh, so there's, this is a good test, you know. Let's see where they where the chips fall. <laughs> okay. You know? And uh, and then uh, uh, Voyager two, I think it was went by one of the Voyagers. I think it was Voyager two went by uh, the planet Uranus in 1986, and it was right smack in the middle of the range of my prediction. That's and amazing. I, I broadened the range a little bit because we don't know too much about the core of that planet. So then uh, it went by. Neptune in 1989, and again, right in the middle of the range for that planet. So, how of the uh, evolutionary scientists or the NASA scientists or whatever they go from the other predictions? How have they been able to um, to to modify their opinions to fit that data? I mean, how do they do? Well, that? they uh, they modified their opinions a little bit. They uh, when Uranus came out so badly wrong, they said, well, you know, Neptune is sort of a sister planet to Uranus, so we'll make our prediction, we'll modify our prediction for Neptune and say that it's 
going yeah, to be also a strong field. So that doesn't help with the Uranus prediction in the first place. No, it didn't. Okay. <laughs> but you see, it was sort of a hand waving theory they had in the first place, so That's it wasn't very quantitative. So now, does it also uh, hold true for the moons of Jupiter? Yes, the moons of Jupiter came out very nicely. Um, that, that came. I didn't even think of including them in the in the paper, uh, but uh, just applied the same formulas that are in the paper, and they fit the moons of Jupiter uh, that were measured uh, much more recently uh, by another space probe, Galileo, mm -hmm. and uh, it fits those moons pretty nicely too. So uh, I'm happy about that. You've got a thousand here. It looks like. Uh, so. so so I'm a, go ahead. Did that, you that one, I didn't actually make a prediction, but it just it, there's no difference in the prediction. So. Well, I have a question uh, about your starlight and time uh, cosmology uh, from Dr. Keith Wanzer. Uh, he asked the question, uh, you know, you start from a ball of uh, water. Mm -hmm. uh, he w he's wondering how uh, this ball of water doesn't collapse upon itself and uh, uh, down to a... Uh, to a uh, s small condensed, you know, like like a black hole or whatever. Well, it would fall and collapse down upon itself like a black hole, and that's what my book talks about. <laughs> so I don't know why he's asking about it. Uh, I'm sure, he, I'm sure that's quite what the question was. Uh, my my book says, "Suppose God created all the matter of the universe." As a, as a ball of water, okay. it would be uh, all the matter we see would be uh, make a ball about um, say uh, one or two light years in diameter. Okay. That ball would immediately start collapsing. Okay. It would make a black hole, and uh, my theory then su suggests that it bounced and became a white hole. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah. expanded out, and uh, the event horizon shrank then, and as it shrank through the central part. God had already made a planet there, the one we're on, and uh, time would be dilated when the event horizon reached the, uh, the Earth there. So I'm not sure he's read that part of my book that talks about that. You know, I, I think that uh, there's Although a lot the three of different your, parts that talk about that. Your, uh, <laughs> your theory uh, sometimes just goes uh, over the head of uh, it, most it, of us. There's, the there's a tremendous amount of... That, that book has a lot of information in it, and I don't think most people are used to... Uh, going through a book very carefully and, and seeing what all the information is there. Uh, the, I guess, uh, unfortunately, the average uh, uh, book that's about that size that is paperback uh, has one, one idea per chapter. <laughs> <laughs> but I tried to pack about one idea per sentence into it. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So that it's a, there's a lot in it, and I don't blame anyone for not you know, digesting it. And your wife puts up with all this abstraction? Uh, very easily. She just doesn't pay too much attention. <laughs> well, <laughs> so no, she well, enjoys this too. And, uh, why don't you, can, maybe why, can, I don't know whether we have time, but maybe in a, in a nutshell or a synopsis for our audience, uh, it would be nice to get it straight from the horse's mouth uh, the the uh, how this works and how this uh, really uh, seems to take, again, another thorny problem that creations have. How far, you know, stars are seemingly billions of light years out there or billions of, you know, they're way out there and uh, yet that works, you, you've been, this theory is able to incorporate that within a very young uh, 2,000 year old universe. So why don't you kind of explain for our audience how that, how that works. Well, the, the main problem in understanding my theory is understanding the Big Bang theory. To understand how my theory contrasts with it, mm -hmm. the big thing, the Big Bang theory, um, as understood by experts, is quite different from the Big Bang theory as understood by everybody else, including most scientists and even many astronomers. Wow. Uh, we all have sort of believed in, um, and I remember having this impression when I started this study. We believed that the Big Bang was sort of an island universe. You know, you had a a whole bunch of galaxies, uh, but they were an island in an otherwise big empty sea of space, right? Okay. And uh, we thought that back in the beginning all these galaxies were a little tiny ball of very hot matter, and that matter expanded out into a big empty space. Right. Uh, so uh, that's, I mean, that's... That's the way you hear it. Uh, that's the way it's taught. Yeah. But that's not what the experts mean when they talk about the Big Bang. The difference is whether or not there's a center and an edge. Uh, our picture 
of an island universe has a center of that cluster of galaxies or a center of that little ball mm -hmm. and then there's a there's an edge to that matter and outside of it is just empty three-dimensional space okay so but the Big Bang universe assumes to start with that all the space there ever was was completely filled by the hot matter of the Big Bang and then space and matter expanded outward together, and this is very difficult to visualize, why, which is why this tape is very good. It'll help you visualize it. Okay. But you have to have an extra dimension to visualize it. The experts don't like to acknowledge the extra dimension of space, not time, the extra dimension of space. As they don't like to acknowledge it as being real, so they don't talk about this at all. So they have let the second tier of scientists and everyone below that, the popularizers, uh, go on in their misunderstanding about the Big Bang. But if you actually study the experts, you'll find that they say it has, the Big Bang has no edge to matter, no center. Actually, the popular understanding of it uh, um, more uh, parallels what the, your uh, theory is so than yes. uh, what... Uh, That's the real irony. <laughs> that is. <laughs> so, uh, for those of you who are out there confused, uh, this wrong picture you had of the Big Bang, just peel off the label Big Bang from it and put Humphrey's crazy cosmology on it <laughs> and you'll be a lot closer to what I'm teaching uh, and uh, you won't have that misconception about the Big Bang. And the difference is that uh, the Earth uh, being a special place uh, in the center of God's creation, is, isn't that uh, so That's true? right. Uh, the scripture talks about the cosmos that scripture pictures is an island universe. There's, uh, there's ordinary matter of the universe and there's some empty space beyond that. And that matter, you can draw a boundary around it and it, and it has a center. And, uh, and scripture talks about that and I talk about that in Appendix B of Starlight and Time, the biblical basis for it. Okay. But uh, that really isn't the geocentrism? Yeah. Not quite. Uh, classical geocentrism says two things. The earth is, they say, they said, and there are still some who say this, that the earth is at the exact center, like right here, uh, and, uh, and that uh, the earth uh, has not ever moved away from the center. Now, I, I don't find scripture being that exact about our location. Uh, on a cosmological scale of distances, I feel confident that scripture is saying we're near, you know, within a, a million light years of the center. Uh, and it, I don't see anywhere where it says that we have remained motionless with respect to the center. Mm -hmm. So even if we were at the center at the beginning, we've moved... Uh, well, all, all motion is relative anyway, so we've uh, we yeah. moved away from what? That's the yeah. question. Well, the Earth from the center, those are two uh, locations you can talk about the Earth with, with respect to the center. Yeah, right, because you're saying the center is, there is there was a real there's center a, or is a real center. There, there still is a real center, and, but I don't know exactly where it is. Okay, so so what happens now is, so uh, with this starlight and time theory is you've got sort of a Big Bang kind of thing, but it's made out of the matter you're saying originally was water, is this correct? Yes. Okay. And converted to other stuff. Um, so like the way I suggested in the, in the book was uh, by fusion, this collapsing ball of hot water would get very hot, and uh, that's when I think that when you get come there right was light. And come uh, right down to it, the astronomers have that in their theory anyway, don't right. they? Yeah. Uh, they originate all the uh, atoms of the universe, the heavy metals and everything from hydrogen, actually. They yes. start with hydrogen right. and they used to start with water. That's supposed yeah, to hydrogen and oxygen. The process is called nucleosynthesis. Now, here's the difference between the Big Bang theory and, and that version of my theory, the, the, uh, the collapsing ball of water expansion. Um, their theory has a problem making any heavier element than helium or beryllium. Some, only the very lightest elements uh, can be made by the Big Bang. The other heavy elements, you know, uranium, iron, yeah, lead, or uh, or any of them, <laughs> all of them, uh, have to be made at the heart of a supernova. And one of the problems is that the Hubble telescope is now seeing these heavy elements, which they would include carbon and oxygen, for example, as heavy elements, they're seeing them too far back and too far out to give much time for the supernovas to make all that no, heavy okay. stuff. So the Big Bang theory is being stretched a little bit there, <laughs> and they're not talking about that. 
But this uh, is much more like a cosmic supernova uh, than it is like a Big Bang, and, uh, and it would generate all the heavy elements right away. So maybe that's the way God chose to make the elements. Um, this would all be on day one when light appeared, uh, and then an expansion on day two, let there be an expanse, something expanded, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, makes the earth and so on, all in ordinary days. Which brings us to the time aspect of it. Um, right. Why does the center affect time so much? And, well, if you have matter having a center, then there's a center of gravity. So gravitational forces can, can point toward a center. Oh, okay. In the Big Bang, you have no center, so you have no center of gravity, so you have no overall pattern of gravitational force to, to reckon with. In the Big Bang, there's as many galaxies that way as there are this way if you're out between galaxies. And so the net force is zero. It's canceled out. Oh. But in this, if, uh, if you're not at the center, then you will feel a very small force pointing you toward the center, pulling you toward the center. It would take you billions of years to get there, uh, but uh, a very small force. But over such cosmic distances, that small force has a big effect on time, and the, uh, it's an effect in Einstein's general theory of relativity. That's the one that hardly anyone knows about. Yeah. Anyway, uh, e, e, e equals mc squared is the one. And, and that's from the special theory of relativity, but there's a broader theory that deals with gravity and acceleration and other things that hardly anyone knows about. But in the general theory of relativity, there's an effect called gravitational time dilation or time stretching. Okay. And, uh, and uh, one of the bottom lines there is that the deeper you are in a gravitational field, the lower you are in altitude, the slower clocks tick. Clocks and all physical processes would run slower. Time would run slower the deeper you are in a gravitational well, or the lower in altitude you are. Lower and slower. Now, is this this, is this a, on a cosmological scale, or is this measurable from Earth? Can we you measure, can measure it here on, on Earth. In, so there are in my book and in this tape, uh, we talk about uh, <coughs> where that's been measured. So it's not science fiction, and it's not just nice theory from Dr. Einstein. Uh, it's actually been measured here on Earth many different ways and quite accurately. Uh, but it's still not a large effect here on Earth. Uh, but over cosmic distances, it could be a very large effect. And so you're saying that uh, the I closer... See, I see we've lost him for a bird. Yeah, well, we've got some hummingbirds Oh, yes, there. we've got lots of hummingbirds. Yeah. And there's a feeder over there, so that's probably oh. why they're orbiting the, the feeder. <laughs> oh, wow, look at that. That guy's really moving around, isn't he? We're yeah, lucky we in can the Rocky Mountains, you find a lot of hummingbirds. So. It's really great. We can always... Uh, we can always edit this thing, but that's kind of cool. Look at that baby. Boy, they really, he's really buzzing. <laughs> wow, he's showing off pretty big time. Okay, well, let's get back to this thing okay. here. Okay, so, gravitational time dilation. Yeah, gravitational time dilation, and the implications are, since we're closer to the center mm -hmm. of this creation, mm -hmm. That um, we would feel more, uh, or the clocks would be running slower here. We would, be, we would be about the last place where clocks uh, would, uh, would uh, start ticking fast. I'm, I'm proposing that during the fourth day of creation, the Earth entered this critical phase of things where its clocks and its processes were running very slow, and uh, and uh, every everywhere else clocks would be running and processes would be running at their normal rate. But on Earth, everything time-locked, frozen, nothing happening here uh, during the fourth day of creation. So that gives away for billions of years worth of history to happen out in the distant cosmos. And yet, as measured by clocks here on Earth, the universe would be very young. So it gives you a way for the light to get to the Earth. Um, that's that's uh, so in other words, if someone was living at the outer edge of this universe, they'd be dead in nanoseconds compared to how long we lived. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah. yeah. If you could have seen on the fourth day, if you could have seen what was happening out there, you would have seen billions of years worth of events happening out there. If you could have seen it, uh, the light wouldn't have been here, but if you could have seen it, you would have seen actual 
this the uh, galaxy spinning around like pinwheels and bumping into each other, the light zooming in toward Earth. So it's like at fast speed out yeah, there, yeah. and we're going fast forward out there, and we're in slow motion down here. Yeah. Is it because we're like? That, I don't think things are like that today. You okay, know, so this, that this was on the fourth day you would have seen that, and then as the expansion of the universe proceeded, uh, the Earth, uh, the, uh, the vicinity of the Earth would uh, move out of this critical. Uh, phase of things. Why was it on the fourth day? I mean, do you have an explanation for why? I mean, I mean, I know the scripture says on the fourth day certain things happen, but I'm saying, how does that work? Um, or do you have a theory? Is it in the book about how that would have worked and how it would have got out of being slow and the other one's fast? I yes, uh, it's just, uh, it wouldn't wouldn't happen at the outset of the expansion and it, and it would be over with at another phase of the expansion, so it had to move through that period. So I, I think uh, God just designed it so that uh, when he was ready to make the stars, uh, the earth was in this phase, because he wanted us to be able to see. So in, a met, in, so in a nutshell, this is why we have stars that seemingly are billions of years old, because uh, they would have to be for us to see light. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're measurable, or to some extent, as being way out there, yeah. uh, and yet still this works with a very young universe based on your right. theory then. Yeah, because with relativity, you know, it's not relativity is not theory, it's measured fact. And relativity compels us uh, to consider the possibility that clocks haven't all ticked at the same rate in all parts of the universe. People have been playing with that for a while. Yeah. Decay, the speed of light type yeah. theories have come up and other kinds of things, but this seems to be the most interesting and least problematic at this juncture. Uh, I mean, th so it makes some sense. So, Rich, when somebody asks you, how old is the universe, what should be your first question? Oh, man, okay. Depends on which perspective. Which, which clock? Which, which clock? clock? Yeah, that's, that's it. Really okay. <laughs> well, I was close. I said which perspective. That's good. You, <laughs> you, know. you both came, did good. Uh, so, hear that out there. If somebody asks you how old the universe is, you should say, which clocks? Whose clocks? But even the Hubble telescope uh, in the last 10 years, let's see, whatever, when it was out there doing some of the exa examination has really caused a lot of these scientists have conniptions, it seems to me. I mean, I remember reading several years ago, I mean, they were, pr they were proposing that the universe was 30 billion light years old. They kept stretching. It was, it was you know, kept, well, things kept getting old. I got 20. I saw one that was, it was like 28 or something like oh, that. Oh, really? Yeah, it was just, in, in, but most were 20, 22. Uh, suddenly that Hubble gets out there and... They have to go. They have to kind of backpedal a bit. Yeah, yeah. They uh, they keep finding out new things about the cosmos from the Hubble, and uh, so cosmology, where it was mostly theory before, and the cosmologists were quite comfortable. Yeah. Uh, now <laughs> uh, the Hubble and other uh, other kinds of measurements out there with the satellites are, are slowly constraining cosmology and nailing it down with experimental facts, observed facts. This is so, causing uh, problems for the Big Bang. And yeah, the but it's, it, it's making it more of a science and less of a theory. And, uh, it's a good thing, but it's, it is stretching the Big Bang theory, and we may, it may snap, and we may have to find another theory that, to replace the Big Bang. I have uh, another question for you, yeah. uh, and this concerns uh, um, fellow creationist Barry Sutterfield and his ideas, and he's been going along merrily with his uh, uh, speed of light uh, decay uh, mm -hmm. concept, and uh, what do you think about that? Okay, about I, I, I do talk about it in my book, and uh, I want to give Barry credit for what he actually, the uh, biggest achievement he made, which was to get all of us creationists thinking about cosmology. You see, cosmology was the, the forbidden subject uh, back before Barry tackled it in the early 80s. Right. Uh, nobody would think about it, and, uh, and those who were in the sciences avoided cosmology. And uh, I hadn't thought about it, and so Barry certainly focused my attention on it. Now, Barry has a particular theory of speed of light decay, which I don't think matches the facts. Uh, he has all of the speed of light changing uh, very rapidly uh, and even down to within the last uh, few decades, still changing and measurably, measurably. Uh, in other words, you could, you could have measured it here on Earth, measured the speed of light change. I'm not sure you could measure it because I'm not certain uh, but what the speed of light is so tied into all the physical forces that every physical process would be related to it. But I might be wrong about that. 
But the main problem is that the actual data uh, that he used to support his theory of decay uh, do not seem to support it when you analyze it carefully. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, but there may be other theories of the speed of light decay that, <laughs> that may work. Uh, there's one by David Harris, for example. Do you know him? David Harris, yeah. yeah we the know Canadian. Him. Yeah, Canadian. We know him pretty yeah. well. We've and uh, back in 1978, in the Creation Research Society Quarterly, he proposed a different kind of speed of light thing before Barry uh, came on the scene. And nobody paid much attention to it. But, uh, but David proposed that at the fall of Adam, that there was a bubble, sort of, so to speak, of, of a speed of what, uh, a wave of the speed of light slowing down that spread out from Earth into the rest of the universe. Now David had it spreading out at today's slow speed of light, and I I ran into a few problems analyzing that, so I wasn't wasn't very enthusiastic about it. But just uh, about six months ago, I realized that if the bubble expanded at the former speed of light very rapidly, mm -hmm. then uh, then those problems that I saw would have, would go away. So I contacted David about it and asked him if he had thought any more about it. And he said no. Uh, he didn't feel like he was really qualified to pursue that. Uh, I think he has a BS in physics, but I'm not sure. Uh, I think he's going mostly into computers now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he said, "Have at it." <laughs> and uh, and, and might, uh, just say I say have at it too to anyone who's listening who's yeah. interested in that. But I just give that as an example of a speed of light theory which I think uh, might be viable. You know, so I don't exclude speed of light theories. Um, the speed of light and time are um, inter intertwined with one another, actually. And you can't really separate them too much. Uh, yeah, and I think most people are, are somewhat, with all our science fiction and stuff we've, mm -hmm. we've grown up with, the black holes, I mean, almost everyone knows or believes, if you will, the black holes, neither light nor time mm -hmm. nor anything can escape it. And so your concept is not that, uh, you know, that unfamiliar with even the oh, layperson yeah. today. The, the mathematics, on the other hand, I tried to read that. <laughs> I have to confess, uh, the math, oh, that was hard to go. Get hairy, yeah, and I think it's, it's not, uh, it's not uh, simplified by the people who practice uh, that math either. But for example, in uh, the video about Stephen Hawking's brief history of time, mm -hmm. there's a picture of a, a of a watch falling into the black hole, and as it reaches the event horizon of the black hole, the the outer boundary of the black hole, uh, the watch slows down and and it stops ticking. Well, Rich, uh, this this was a tape that we uh, I found just recently uh, in my uh, drawer, uh, <laughs> and I, w I wanted to uh, bring it back back to life because there's a whole lot of good things that uh, Dr. Humphreys. Uh, uh, has done research with. Yeah, he's still going strong today, but Doug, how, this was, you said, uh, 15 about 15 years, years, years ago. 15, this reminds years you of ago. lost films they're discovering in the archives. Right. We found something that we interviewed with Dr. Humphreys all this all this long time ago, and uh, his and theories still hold a lot of, uh, a lot of weight, a lot of, uh, a lot of sway in the creation circles even today, Doug. When, well, when certainly the, his, this, his uh, predictions that he made were uh, something that really uh, were uh, groundbreaking, and uh, and he tackled a lot of the tough questions that yes, he the did. creationists were afraid to tackle uh, back in the day. And now, uh, now there's a, a, a pretty good, uh, solid foundation that people can build on. And basically, what he's done is uh, uh, taken the uh, Einstein's theory of relativity for the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the general theory of relativity, and use that to, um, to show that the, if the, you start out with the assumption that the, the Earth is somewhere in the near the center of of the universe, the universe, yeah, uh, and uh, that the expansion happened from there. Uh, it was a, uh, you know, the, the formulas actually work out so that... Uh, yeah, and you get you, what we see. You get what you which see. Is, which is really kind of uh, disturbing to uh, secular geologists or evolutionary geologists, or not geologists, uh, ast astronomers and ast astrophysicists, uh, because it does seem to be that we yeah. are at the relative center of the universe. It's kind of and, interesting. And the idea that uh, at the uh, event horizon where uh, actually time almost comes to a... Uh, slow slows down to a standstill, and out in the 
uh, cosmos, the uh, you know the starts time, speeding up. It starts, starts speeding up. Yeah. That's what makes uh, makes the, his theory work. Yeah, and the idea that we were at one time maybe virtually in the center of a black hole at the beginning, or right, yeah. and then yeah, because the general theory of relativity. I, I can't remember if Doug has been so long since I've seen the tape. Whether you talked about that or not, it's not not like Einstein's special theory, which everyone right. e equals mc squared. It's not about light, the speed of light. It's really about gravity affecting time, and it's right. kind of neat. I never even knew that was a general theory as well as a uh, special theory like that. I always heard about the and light what's one. What's interesting is that mm -hmm. the, uh, the theory of relativity, uh, I mean the Big Bang Theory as it's uh, understood by the, the scientists who really uh, talk about it, uh, really is a lot different than the popular model. Conception, correct, the yes. The popular conception is actually much more uh, closer to Humphrey's theory right. than it is the what the what the Big Bang theorists use, and so yeah, yeah this has been a, a good time to uh, for me to go back and review what he has uh, uh, he has said in this, and uh, uh, what I like about him is that he explains things um, actually relatively simply so that people can understand it, and he takes a very abstract concept and uh, then uh, takes it and. Uh, just explains it in a very uh, down-to-earth manner. He's also very open about if there were problems. He's actually, over the years, he's actually re reworked some things that were problematic mm -hmm. and uh, not just trying to force something into a into a theory, but he says, okay, yeah, this this is why this would have happened. And uh, it's pretty pretty interesting stuff. Over the years, he's, he's modified the theory a little bit. You know, basically, right. basically it's kind of like the way... I, I can't even really... In, in this short time we have left to do for the show, I can't really go into it, but it's kind of neat how he talks about how the the warping of space and time and stuff like that it's 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 pretty wild wild hairy stuff but you realize that the creator made a big big universe dug out there we 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 only just beginning to explore the possibilities right anyway um, the the show is about the uh, rate project uh, and and the, then uh, Russell Humphrey's uh, predictions about the uh, the magnetic fields of uh, Uranus and Neptune. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the fascinating, uh, uh, and actually the the, uh, the moons of Jupiter fit in his model. Right, as that's well. correct. Yep. And and so uh, then uh, then finally his uh, white hole cosmology, which is um, uh, you know is something that uh, uh, and he invites other people to uh, to. Uh, produce their own theories you know there's like a speed of light theory that he liked which was, was uh, with uh, uh, David Harris and he yeah. mentioned that so anyway uh, we hope you enjoyed our uh, interview with D. Russell Humphreys we'll see you next time on Revolution Against Evolution <laughs>